Hi everyone, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, and a big thank you to all the organisers for putting on this um, uh, this conference. Uh, so I'm Andy Biggin from Liverpool. Um, I'd like to talk to you uh, today about some work that some of us at Liverpool have been doing um, with Chris Davies and John Mound at Leeds. Uh, hope to persuade you that there's evidence from combining paleomagnetic um, field observations with um, dynamo simulation results to suggest that there is this uh, phenomena of um, regional stratification uh, within uh, or the very top of, of Earth's outer core. And uh, there will be a talk given on a very similar theme tomorrow by John Mound, uh, but he'll be looking at much shorter timescales of this. So there is, um, so uh, hopefully that, that will help maybe hammer home some of the points that I'm trying to make here. Okay, so starting off with, I've got a working definition of the paleomagnetic uh, field up here and a bunch of um, properties uh, which define the paleomagnetic field. And just to highlight that uh, in this talk, really focusing on just this lower uh, property. So paleosecular variation in terms of how the, um, uh, the vari what the variability of the, of the field can tell us over these, um, these time scales of hundreds of thousands of years and longer. Okay, so I'm illustrating this with using um, Yael's uh, data set from her 2020 paper. So each of these site mean directions is from a lava flow on the island of uh, St. Helena. And we convert these then to virtual geomagnetic poles. So these are best fitting uh, dipoles uh, to define the direction at that um, at the place where we we measured it, uh, and then what we end up with is a cloud of these VGPs from which we can extract the angular standard deviation or the VGP dispersion S, as we call it. And when we plot this against the latitude, indeed the, the the paleo latitude, if we're looking far back in time, and we see these tend to 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 form. Um, a pattern where the increase with latitude going away from the equator, and this can be reasonably well described by a simple quadratic relationship, which we call model G. Um, so this has just got two parameters, A, which defines the VGP dispersion at the equator, and B, which defines um, the dependency of the VGP dispersion on latitude. And it's really this a parameter that's the key one here, the VGP dispersion at the equator or the paleo equator. And the reason um, that's important in the context of this talk is that we can, um, we showed in a, um, a paper that I presented on this conference last year, uh, that this can be related uh, very closely. It's a nice proxy for a power law relationship to a definition of the shape of the, the Earth's magnetic field or the average shape. So that's this term here given by AD over NAD. So that's uh, axial dipole um, as a function, or sorry, as a ratio proportion of the, the rest of the field. So how dominant is the axial dipole um, on average? And to give you an idea of um, what this means. So uh, in this column, we've got Earth shown by IGRF, uh, present radial field at the Earth's surface. Here we've got it going, uh, this AD over NAD going back. Uh, through time over the last 100,000 uh, years, a uh, median value of about 20. So we're around about um, uh, up here on this, on this curve. And you can see that there's various green points around here. These are various different geomagnetic uh, field models. And they then predict this model GA parameter, which we've uh, measured for the last 10 million years using uh, PSV10 and Cromwell et al. Um, so these points plot on this, on this curve, but then we get dynamo simulations like these three over here, which uh, show very different behavior, but still correlated. So we've got one here that's very um, GAD-like, so with the axial uh, dipole very dominant, uh, you can see, and these lines uh, parallel to, to latitude nearly, and this has got a much lower VGP dispersion uh, curve and model GA parameter. And then we've got this one, which is somewhat intermediate. And then at the end, we've got something that's uh, very non-dipolar um, with a very low ratio of AD over NAD. And this has got very high VGP dispersion and a high model G A parameter. 
So this got us very excited because it allows us to relate something which we can measure going back very deep in time, which is these, um, these model G parameters, uh, with something which previously we hadn't really been able to get a handle on before about 100,000 years ago, which is uh, the extent to which the axial dipole uh, dominates the field. Um, so what we've done here is produce um, model G fits. This time we're only uh, we're normalizing everything, putting on the same hemisphere uh, for very, very long time periods. Um, three, going back right through Earth's history. So we've got this new composite plot from the last uh, 300 million years. So various studies go into this, the latest of which is, is by Ben Hanford, student at Liverpool. Uh, he looked at uh, the Triassic and the, the Permo Carboniferous supercrons. So his data set is, is in here, along with those from the, uh, from the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic. Um, and then these two over here, much older time periods, um, uh, these were published by Vitalin and then Pesodin in, in 2014. And the key observation here is the model G that you fit to these data sets is remarkably similar. So these parameters are nearly within error of each other for these vastly different um, time periods. And remembering that this model G A parameter in particular is strongly related to the shape of the field, then what that's implying is that the average shape of the field has remained remarkably stable over geological history. And you know, there's been there's evidence from sort of paleoclimate studies linked to paleomagnetic studies that you know the shape of the field has been uh, you know gad-like for, for long periods of time, but this is some extra insight um, into that. Uh, but the big question then is, is you know, why should the magnetic field be stable on these, these very long um, geological time scales? It's, it's not as if the, um, the, the geodynamo, uh, which is responsible for it, has not been subject to a lot of external forcing during uh, that time period. So to illustrate that, I've borrowed this figure here from uh, a recent paper that we published with, with Chris Davies in, in GGI. Um, so we're just looking at the top panel here. We've got two models, um, one shown by um, two models of uh, core thermal evolution. Uh, so one shown by continuous lines, one shown by dashed lines. And in black, um, we have the total heat flow across the core mantle boundary and two N member models really here. So what we've got uh, this one at the top here is shows is a very, very high core, core mantle boundary heat flow early in Earth's history and then uh, decreasing to much lower values as time progresses. And this other one, the dashed line, showing more or less continuous, um, constant um, core mantle boundary heat flow. And it's this heat flow which is ultimately, by cooling the core, is driving the geodynamo. OK, but then we've also got these red lines as well, which are related to these, but show just the power available to actually drive the geodynamo. This is a very, it's a very inefficient process, so the power that the, that the core can extract um, uh, to actually uh, to build the magnetic field is a lot less than the, the power that's lost um, across the core boundary. Uh, so we can see in this first, in the case of the first model, this red line is um, is tracking uh, the total uh, core mantle boundary heat flow um, through time, getting less and less um, uh, over uh, as geological time progresses. In the dashed line, we've got it starting at a very low value, but then increasing uh, marginally through time, but and these are very different core thermal evolution models, but what they both predict, and I think it's, it's fairly you know, consensus across the deep earth community that in the last half, probably the last quarter of the earth's history, you had a major event occurring in terms of the core's um, energetics, which is the inner core nucleating. So the first freezing of iron at the center of the earth um, will have been a game changer for the core uh, because suddenly you are releasing large amounts of, of light elements uh, at the base of the core. And this is introducing additional source of power, efficient source of power to, to drive the geodynamo in terms of compositional uh, buoyancy. So what happens in both these models is that these red lines suddenly jump up. So the core is uh, suddenly getting a power um, uh, surge then as the inner core nucleated, which as I say, probably happened in the last um, billion years or so. 
Now, if we look at geodynamo simulations, when you give them a power burst, when you, when you uh, ramp up the convective vigor in the core by increasing the Rayleigh number, uh, as we're doing as we move from left to right in these two plots, then they change their behavior very dramatically. Okay, so we've got a, a bunch of uh, 89 different numerical dynamo simulations. Some of these have been, um, most of these have been published before. A few of them are new. Um, got them divided up on the left and right side as whether well they're, they're, they're forced through, through chemical buoyancy release at the, at the base of the outer core or whether they're thermally driven from both the top and the base of the, of the outer core. Um, and what you can see in, in nearly every case is that as you increase the Rayleigh number, then you're dramatically going up on this y-axis, which is this model GA parameter. That is, you are increasing the paleosecular variation. And it's very quickly leaving Earth-like bounds, which is shown by this kind of golden zone um, down here. Uh, so these seem to be predicting that we would struggle then through Earth's history to maintain a paleosecular variation and indeed a shape of the magnetic field similar to what we have today. Okay, and so this is illustrated over here. I've got this golden zone um, in here where most of the, the green circles are, the, the recent geomagnetic field models are. And you see that actually it's pretty difficult to get dynamo models which are shown by these black hollow circles um, in, this, uh, in this golden region. Yeah, they're much more comfortable being at, being at higher values. Okay, so this raises then a big question, which I'm going to try and address, which is what are the dynamo simulations missing that stabilizes the paleomagnetic field on these geological timescales? So to answer that, we're using a new suite of, of geodynamo simulations. Uh, these are very computationally expensive because they are run at a more Earth-like regime. In particular, um, the Ekman number is lower. The Ekman number describes the ratio of the viscous to the rotational uh, forces, it's extremely small in the Earth. And um, what some non-magnetic simulations have suggested is that as you get down below the level at which all the other simulations um, that we've shown are, are um, uh, a runner, then you, you, you enter a new regime, this rapidly rotating regime. And this is one whereby um, it's still sufficiently strongly driven, the Rayleigh number is high enough that you get turbulence, um, but also the rotational force is sufficiently strong to exert a, a lot of water in, in the flow in the core. So, so, so looking like this uh, model over here in the middle rather than the one above or, or below it. Now, the other thing that makes some of these new models um, arguably more realistic is that they incorporate very strong thermal heterogeneity on that upper boundary. So this is seismically inferred. Uh, the base of the mantle, very heterogeneous. We have these LLVPs, these uh, large low velocity provinces, one under the Pacific, one under Africa. And um, taking this figure from uh, John Mound's paper, he'll be talking more about these tomorrow. Um, but essentially where you have these very hot regions on the base of the mantle, then underneath uh, this region, when you're in this low Ekman number regime, uh, then what you get are these lenses. So where you get effectively core fluid that is too hot to uh, participate in the convection of the, the rest of the outer core, despite the outer core as a whole being, um, uh, being super adiabatic. Okay, so let's have a look at the effects of, of having these regional inversion layers in the, um, in the core, or in these simulations at least. Okay, so these are the results of our six new models. And you can see, just looking at all of them, we've got VGP lat latitude, tried to show these sort of paleomagnetically, uh, where paleomagnetists would be comfortable. So we've got VGP latitude at a site location not too far from, from here, mid latitudes. Um, and down at the bottom, which is where I want to focus your attention, this is the um, VGP dispersion curves uh, with model G um, fit to each of them. Okay, and what we see is five of these models actually look pretty similar in their behavior. And then there's one that goes completely screwy and we have lots of reversals and this very high VGP dispersion. So what's special about this one? Well, I'd say on the left here, we've got uh, ones that are run with low Rayleigh number. Um, so a relatively low um, amount of vigor uh, in the convection. And over here, we've got three times higher Rayleigh number. So these are more vigorously convecting. Um, and you can see that increasing the Rayleigh number um, for these 
uh, and some of this hasn't had the effect of destabilizing them. But in this one, it has. And what's special about that? Well, this one was run with homogeneous boundary conditions. So without, uh, so it had uh, no means of creating these, this regional stratification. And these other uh, two run at both radio numbers are run with these heterogeneous boundary conditions and formed regional inversion layers. Okay, so is it the heterogeneity alone? Well, we don't think so because some of these, um, going back to the figure that I showed you earlier, some of these simulations, the ones shown in blue, were also run with heterogeneous boundary conditions, but they weren't run at this low F1 number regime and they didn't form what we would typically call regional inversion layers. But to show you in the context of these new models, what these look like, so now they, all three start off um, in or close to this golden zone. But then when you increase the Rayleigh number um, by a factor of three, the one with homogeneous boundary conditions shoots up to very high model GA parameters, very unstable, becomes very non-dipolar, just like the other uh, models do. But then these two with the regional stratification incorporated in them somehow maintain their, um, their stability. Okay, and just to show you what the, that looks like in terms of the, um, uh, the shape of the field. And so here's this golden zone, here's these five models all sitting inside them and filling in this, this uh, large gap that we're otherwise missing, uh, where we're otherwise missing dynamo simulations. But then here's your, um, your model with the uh, homogeneous boundary conditions all the way down here. Okay, so in, in answer to the question, what are these dynamo simulations missing that might cause these stabilization? possible answer is these regional inversion lenses. Um, now, why might they be doing that? I'm going to not spend very long on this because uh, John will be talking much, much more detail about this, but just to give you some inkling. Um, so essentially, if we, we're looking at the in the middle of the core now and, and radial uh, flow, and you can uh, see if you look closely at the scale that the, the flow is about twice as fast in the mid core um, in the high Rayleigh number cases, in the low Rayleigh number case, and this is having a big impact on the fields uh, down there as well. You can see it looks very different, much more uh, small scale uh, in the middle of the core. And then when we go up to the core surface or just below for the flow um, plots, we can see now the feature dominating uh, both flows is these regional inversion lenses. So these have um, been maintained despite increasing the vigor of convection. So possibly what's happening is um, because they're such large scale um, features, even though the flow is, is much faster in the um, high Rayleigh number uh, case, it's also so small scale that it's struggling to disrupt this very large scale um, feature which, which persists. And what effect is that having on the field? Well, it's meaning that that's dominated at low latitudes by these large areas. This is centered on the Pacific, by the way, so underneath the Pacific at LSVP. Um, by a region where the field is, is very weak. So you may well be asking then, well, you know, this is big changes in, in longitude um, that we're seeing in magnetic field. You know, do we see a signature um, uh, in longitudinal variations of the paleomagnetic field that would implicate these um, uh, such regional inversion lenses? Well, so this is a prediction um, from the four models with the, uh, with the rills in them. And you, what you've got to remember is that we're 3,000 kilometers above the core mantle boundary here, so at the Earth's surface. So these longitudinal variations get smoothed out quite a bit, but they're still there. You can see a, um, a long wavelength pattern. Um, now, if we compare this directly to variations, so this is VGP dispersion we're looking at um, again on the, um, on the Y axis. So if we compare this to, to direct measurements from PSV10, uh, with longitude, what you can see is that, well, actually there's a lot of noise in these measurements, you know, the signal might be there, it might not, we just can't pull it out. Um, so we have to look at something else. Now, fortunately, we've got this fairly recent model, GGF100K from Penobscot et al. So that's running over 100,000 years, which is, you know, a reasonable amount of time to, to get a, um, you might expect to get a time average uh, signal. And very interesting, uh, to see that this um, actually coming naturally out of this model, I don't think it was something that they, they put in there deliberately, is this uh, very similar long wavelength uh, structures in VGP uh, dispersion. So I'd say this is some 
Um, extra evidence then that we, that we might be seeing um, the effect of regional stratification in the um, NDS core. Okay, so just before I finish, I'll just make another quick shout out. Simon already mentioned this, but um, yeah, we just published this paper and a shiny new website. Um, this is this was a, a lot of work by all of us at Liverpool, but especially uh, Richard and, and, and Greg, and Richard's got a post on this tomorrow, so we'll, we'll uh, suggest you go see that. Uh, and here's my summary slide, which I won't dwell on. I guess I'll just point out for anyone who's been asleep, just this, this fourth point here, which is the most important one. So we've been comparing paleomagnetic observations and these geodynamo simulations, and they uh, suggest that there, there, there could be regional stratification, regional inversion uh, lenses within um, Earth's core, but not just today, but back through geological time. Thanks. Woo! I heard a woo. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thank you, Andy. Uh, do we have any any questions? I might have missed this, Andy, but what what causes the formation of these lenses? Or, or do, do... I'm sorry. Um, so essentially, that it's the. Um, so John's going to talk a, bit, a lot more about this tomorrow, but it is, you've got the LLVPs, so very hot regions on the, the base of the mantle um, that might have been there a very long time, and um, essentially heating or not allowing the core below to cool down as much as elsewhere where you've got, you know, slab graveyards and things. So the core flow, um, so the core just becomes very hot in the top few hundreds of kilometers of the um, uh, of the outer core and just doesn't participate in the um, uh, in the convection that the rest of the, the, the core is, is undergoing. Makes sense. So we have a question in the chat from Hannah Sanderson. Mm. How long do we expect the lenses to last? Will they grow, shrink with time? Uh, that is a very good question, Hannah. Um, so I guess they last as long as the mantle structures uh, last. And um, yeah, it's, it's a very, um, a great big can of worms to ask whether these things exist, you know, over, uh, I think everyone agrees that they exist at least over the last uh, few hundred million years, you know, back to the time of Pangaea. Before that, um, bets are completely off. There's some who believe that they might be, you know, go back right through the history of the earth. There's others that think that the lowermost mantle is actually dynamic enough and, and changes with the supercontinent cycle such that on you know billion year time scales they're going to move around um, and stuff uh, uh, as well um, grow and shrink so that depends on the origin of the llvps themselves whether they're you know intrinsically dense material um, that uh, yeah, basically just sits there and, and gets hot and, and can never uh, come up to the surface or whether they're purely thermal signature, they're plumes, uh, clusters, um, which in which case they'll be, be, be rising and being replenished. Um, but then you would expect if you've got particularly quiescent uh, mantle convection, so, you know, a time of low subduction uh, flux at the surface, then you might expect these to diminish as well, possibly. Uh, so it's a real open question. Um, but, you know, this maybe comes down on the side of these things being being quite long lived, if not in the same shape, because we haven't tried burying the shape at all. But certainly they're always being, you know, um, large portions of the lowermost mantle sufficiently hot to stop the underlying core fluid from uh, participating in the flow. I may ask. Yeah, you mentioned uh, that there may have been uh, some vigorous convection because of the nucleation of the inner core, and um, I I always thought that uh, when you have a convection uh, from the inner to in 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 the outer core, that uh, there must be uh, rules that follows the uh, corollary forces. And therefore, anything that uh, is going upward 
or downward on the northern hemisphere has a certain helicity and opposite is on the other side. And, uh, and this would, of course, make a kind of equator that would not uh, that would not be crossed. And I didn't see anything like this in, in your images. And so I was just, maybe just, I'm looking at it through simplistic. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right that the Earth's rotation, the Coriolis force is, you know, is, is a major player in, in the dynamo, right? I mean, um, but the formation of the inner core is not going to have much of an effect on that. I mean, it's going to move the buoyancy distribution much deeper in the core. So before that, you have, um, you know, you only have, well, assuming that we don't have something exotic like silicates being precipitated through the, through the core, which is, you know, which is a, a possibility in the ideas of some. But in the classical model, before inner core nucleation, you only have um, buoyancy released at the top of the core, which is from the, yeah, essentially from uh, the, the mantle extracting heat uh, from it and creating cold stuff, which then wants to sink down. Okay, once you've got, now that's still going to happen once you've got the inner core, um, but then, yeah, you're going to be releasing this, um, this buoyancy from um, at the base of the core, so positively buoyant stuff um, uh, from the bottom, as well as negatively buoyant stuff at the top. Okay, now, um, all of that vertical motion, you're absolutely right, will then get entrained into helical motion, you know, into these Taylor columns aligned with the, with the rotation. And the geometry of the large scale core flow, which is something we haven't dealt with in this study, will change radically when you have a you know, big ball of solid iron at the center of the earth then. Um, but yeah, I don't, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not going to have, a, have an effect on the Coriolis force itself. Does that make sense? It does make some sense. I was, I just was hoping to see some kind of a counterclockwise, clockwise motions in your models, and I haven't seen it. That's why I asked that question. Oh well, this is just—it's only the radial field that I was showing in the um, uh, in in the snapshots of the. Um, uh, of the core flow. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Sorry, the radial um, radial flow. Yeah. 